No mai, haere mai. You're on Otago Access Radio and it's five o'clock. Welcome to the last episode of Rattling the Chains, which is our little series about the mayoral contest here in Dunedin. Now, as we go to air, there's a fire burning down the slopes of Flagstaff right above the city. And that's bound to be a metaphor for something, but I'm um, not sure what actually. But so um, should make for a lively program in any case. Let's welcome our last three contestants. Uh, they have, they are a student who wants to, the community to stand up, Scout Barbara Evans, Kira Scout. Kia ora. A business coach who wants to rebuild sands, uh, St. Clair's sand groins, Jules Radich. Hello, Jules. Kia ora. And a wedding celebrant who says she wants to be celebrant in chief, Mandy Mayhem Bullock. Welcome. Kia ora. What do you think of the fire? Have you been watching it? Mm. I mean, you don't see this all the time in Dunedin, especially not in September. I'm quite surprised, eh? It's of concern. How did it start? I hope it wasn't deliberate. I could definitely see flames. Mm. And it's a worry with the high winds forecast for this evening. And now they've started evacuating some homes, so it's getting quite serious. Absolutely. And with the high winds, that'll really trigger things, you know, stir things along. There's a lot of gorse on Flagstaff, so it burns particularly well. And unfortunately, the burning, effect yeah. is that it grows even more prolifically after a fire. Right, right. Yeah, no, well, we'll have to just see how it comes out. Um, well, how's the campaign going? Is that a fire? Is it burning? <laughs> We're in the last week, eh? It's a bit of a rave, really. We're all yeah. having a really good time. Yeah. Is it busy, Scout? Yeah, it's incredibly busy. Um, I, I feel like the job for actually running for mayor might be more than the actual job of being mayor itself. It's like the American election campaigns. Yeah. Yeah, it's good training, if nothing else, right? Yeah. But it's getting pretty intense. What's your feeling about uh, the campaign this time? Is it different from... You did it last time, didn't you, Scout? Yeah, I did. Is it different or the same? I would say it's a little bit different. Um, now that the job's open, people are a lot more focused on getting that role, getting the mayoralty. Um, there's... I... Yeah, it's it's a very different attitude that I'm seeing. Because it's wide open? This time. Yeah. Hmm. But there's still the same camaraderie that we had last election. A lot of us who all ran last election, we're all getting along like a, I'm not going to say house on fire, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, choose your words carefully. Yeah, but um, but it feels like at least there's some shared kind of uh, humanity yeah. about the whole thing. Yeah. 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 Um, are the issues different? What about three years ago? What are you talking about this time? Yeah, um, so three years ago, a lot of the stuff we were talking about was in terms of getting a hospital rebuilt, and now that we've, we have a hospital being rebuilt, so that's a big change. Um, there was a lot of discussion last election about the flooding in St. Clair as well. It was quite a fresh trauma for a lot of people. Um, so this election, we are able to continue those discussions, which that's really starting to look quite productive. And I know that the council themselves have been doing a lot of work recently as well in this area. So there's a sense that things are moving on as a city. Yeah, I, I feel like that. Hmm. I hope the other candidates Yeah, what do you like say, that. Mandy? Like, oh, how do you, I think how do you South feel? Dunedin is still very much on the radar. I felt like uh, last election, a lot of people from South Dunedin were standing because they were upset. And um, that's still there. W- what are we gonna do about it? Um, so I, I still think that is a key issue this time round, but um, I'm impressed with the number of candidates standing. I think it indicates that the public are really looking for change. And of course, with the mayoralty wide open, we've got so many people running for the seat. Yeah, we've been talking about that a bit. And one of the things that people have said is that they've had to admit that they weren't sure if they really wanted to be mayor, but they had to put themselves up for mayor to get them cut through. And if, like, because you've got 40 candidates for councillor. Mm-hmm. Oh, I want to be the but mayor. Do you want to be the mayor, Mandy? Really? I do. I you do. do. Scout, do you want to be the mayor? Or I is think this... I would make a bloody good mayor. <laughs> Jules? Most definitely. So you're not in it just to be councillor? No. No. None of you. I'm already the mayor of Waititi. Unofficial or official? Self-appointed. Self-appointed, excellent. Like um, Brian Tamaki, eh? Bishop. Oh, please, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> All right. Put me in the same sentence. No, no, that's interesting. But you're all seriously thinking about what it might be like to step in because you're all outsider candidates in a sense. You haven't, you've, I know you've got community board experience, but still, you're coming in, you haven't been on council and all of that. Um, how do you prepare yourself for that? <clears throat> Any ideas? 
Well, I have a very clear idea and a very clear agenda. And so as I've put out in my material, including the flyers that are going out this week, I've started with uh, values and culture as the underpinning of everything that happens in council. So with the councillors and the council staff and out to the citizenry itself. So I've been involved with a lot of businesses over the years and a lot of people, and uh, I've been had a lot of experience at bringing people to the same table to be able to chart a way forward, get everyone aligned about a clear direction. Ideally in a business, it's about a clear target, but I wouldn't suggest that for the council. Just all looking in the same direction, I think will make a big difference to the incoming council. It's been a council that has some um from the outside, looks fairly riven by, by strife, eh? I mean, there's been the, the Lee Mayor Cull thing, Absolutely. and there's been, yeah, and there's been a lot of dissent. How do you, or, or uh, I go is that to a just... lot of council meetings, and I do think it's a difficult job, and um, the councillors are very professional, but there are some personal politics. Mm. And has that overridden the public interest, or is it okay? Mm, has it gotten in the way? I think it's a, it's a tricky thing running for a position like this because there's this public pressure to say, you know, when we're on the stages or when we're on air like this or anything, it's we, we kind of have to stand here and say, here is our grand vision of Dunedin and here is what I will single-handedly do to fix mm. the city. Mm. But that's not what being on council is. It's a collaborative role and being the mayor is a facilitatorship role. So you have to be able to facilitate a group of 14 people who might be disagreeing with other people, might be disagreeing with you. And so you have to have really good conflict resolution skills, really good facilitatorship skills. You have to be, you know, compassionate and understanding, but you also have to know when to put your foot down. Yeah. And there's another aspect too, which is that the community wants to vote in a whole diversity of range of mm. views and people, right? As it should so they don't be. want everyone to be the same. Yeah. And so therefore, of course, there's going to be conflict because even if it's just a conflict of ideas, right, there's going to be difference. Yeah. Right. So how do you manage that? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, the council does do You're a celebrant. How do you manage that? How uh, do you manage the un unruly wedding? <clears throat> um, professionally. So the thing the council does as soon as the election finishes is they start training the newly elected members. And there's two days of training sessions every week all the way till Christmas, I believe. So by the time um, the first council meeting actually happens, everyone has good solid grounding in what their um, code of conduct is and uh, actually what the powers are for people in council. Mm. Of course, I think we're answerable to the public and we should be the voice of the public. Um, we should be able to listen and act on what the residents of Dunedin are seeking in that leadership. Mm. Um, Jules, you've been everywhere the last couple of weeks. I saw a full page ad in the ODT. Has it been more than one of those? You've got billboards that are very large and very present. So I think you might be the big spender this campaign. Is that right? I'm certainly not the biggest spender, but I've. You don't uh, think? I think I, I do, yes. Mm. He hasn't got his photo on the back of a bus yet. Ah, yet. that's right. Ah. That's on the and list, there's just, right? uh, you know, there's <laughs> other councillors or other mayoral candidates with even, or just as many signs as myself and bigger ones in other places. However, I suppose uh, I would like to, I suppose just as my I plan for the city, I aim to get the best value out of my marketing dollars, and I'd like to give ratepayers the best value for their hard-earned rates money. So I have uh, been pretty careful about where I've put my signs, and I have a lot of private placements of you know people that I know and friends around the city. So in addition to the standard. Uh, areas, the mm -hmm. DCC approved areas where everyone is. I have a lot of uh, private areas around the place and try to give a good spread to that. How much would you be spending though, could you say? Uh, I mean you allowed to spend what, 55000 I'm presuming you're not quite right. going there. I'll be less than half of that. All right. But, uh, but it's, it's a significant money isn't it? Money, yes. It's serious money. Yeah. And is it worth it? I don't know. It depends <laughs> if I get the mayoral tea. But I, I have to spend a lot more money than anyone else uh, who's seriously contending for the mayoralty because the others are coming from council. Right. So they already they've already been in the news for the last three years or more, you know, six or even nine years. Mm -hmm. So they've had a lot of public profile. Whereas I'm only known to the people that know me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's helpful. I've had 20 years in a motorcycle shop. Yep. So there's a fair number. So of you have a certain sorry, a certain public uh, understanding. But but that's right. You're coming from 
uh, a bit of the darkness. As a politician, mm-hmm. I'm coming from absolutely nowhere, ground zero. Right. So Mandy's far ahead of me. Scout, you've been in Women's Day. You get the, you got <laughs> yeah. an advantage there too. Yeah, no, I do have a really good public profile this election. You know, last election, I was 180 votes away from election to council on an $80 budget. So I feel like there is there are ways to get some cut through, but it is incredibly challenging. And I recognise that the only reason I'm getting the cut through is that I'm quite different from a lot of the other candidates. Mm. Um, I can quite happily say that my budget is no more than one thousand five hundred dollars this year, and that's a lot of money to play with for me. So, yeah, it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? You have to work it out. Mandy, you spending or uh, not? Yeah, my tax return. Last year, I renovated the bathroom. This time, I've made giant pictures of myself to plaster around town. So, I think I've spent about two thousand dollars so far, mm. and I still got flyers and badges to print. It's not like anything else in your life, is it? Really, because it's it's a bit of a punt. You know, it's like it, I mean, it's not lottery. I acknowledge, but still, you, you have to put up money, are you, for yeah. something that you don't even know, one, if you're going to get in. You don't even know if you're going to get that money back. Right. You have to get a certain percentage to get your registration costs back. Right, right. So it's quite a big punt to it. Bit of leap of faith, huh? Very good. All right. Hey, let's do a three-minute Who Are You quiz. Um, I have a very expensive timer here, and I'm going to start it. Um, and I'm going to ask you very quick fire questions, if you like. Answer as quick as you can, and we'll get through as many as we can. And uh, we can find out a bit more about who you are. All right, let's go. So, your full name, Mandy. Amanda Elizabeth Olympia Mayhem Bullock. Great. Scout River Barbie Evans. River? Yeah, River. Yeah, cool. Jules Vincent Raddick. Yeah, excellent. Are you Raddick, not Vradich? Uh, My apologies. Sp- I've been optional getting it wrong all these years. I'm not bothered. You're Raddick. Okay. Radich is probably more correct. Yeah. No, no. Well, it's, it's your name. Uh, Favourite school? Waitati Primary. Kai Cry Primary. Uh, St. Kevin's on Maroon. Mm-hmm. What you mostly do all day? Think. Lucky you. Change nappies. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> Help people with their businesses. All right. Um, another job that you would like to have one day? Funeral director. Mm-hmm. I would like to work in public health. Hmm? My next job, I'd like to be mayor. Okay. Oh, that was a good answer. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> Kitching. Um, right on message. Uh, something that you like to collect. I was assuming I was the mayor. Mm. Um, you are the mayor of what? I, I collect votes this <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, pass. <laughs> I don't pass. like clutter. A few things, but art. Oh yeah, clicking out. Mm. Art, books, and wine. What sort of art? Uh, New Zealand art. Mm. Mm. Cool. All right. Um, oh, all right. a Flagstaff fire question. What would you like to burn down? Oh. <laughs> You're excited. That scared you, didn't it? <laughs> um, no, nothing. Uh, yeah. Okay. No. Knock down, tear down? The patriarchy. Ah, oh, see, I knew someone <laughs> would get something like that. Uh, racial prejudice. Ah, there you go. See? No. All right, moving on. Um, your favourite cafe? Morning Magpie. Blacks Road Green Grocer. Mm. Yeah. Daily. Uh, Daily Coffee Company. Ah, okay. Excellent. Uh, favourite movie of all time? Don't mind who answers this one. Groundhog Day. Ah. Meet the Robinsons. Funny. Uh, On the spot there, Mandy. Reservoir Dogs. Ah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, top thing on your bucket list before you die? Mayor of Dunedin. All right. Finally graduate. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have much of a bucket list, but yeah, I'll go with Mayor of Dunedin. All right, good. And uh, Copycat. The, the politician yeah. of all time that you most admire? Materia Toure. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, eh? Did it tough. Toss up between Materia and Golrez Garaman. Hmm. Green candidates, good. Nelson Mandela. Yeah, it's hard to beat him, too. All right, and the last one best way to relax? In the bath. Bubbles, candles, nice little beverage. Whiskey. No children. Favourite beverage? <laughs> Time, but we'll finish this one. Scout. Gin. Playing. Sorry. Playing video games with cider. Oh, okay. I haven't tried that. Fishing for blue cod. Uh, very good. Thank you all. Excellent. Really, really good. All right. Um, can, Jules, can we talk about your groins? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't say groin. Okay, um, you took out a full-page ad in the ODT about this. Um, what 
are you banging on about? <laughs> well, I took a full page about my whole platform. I know, but so still, you had pictures of, of sand and little values. and little, you and know, sand catchers. Yeah, All right, so can you explain just very briefly? Okay, so this is critically important for Dunedin uh, on so many levels. So, in the first instance, in the first instance, uh, groins protected the sand dunes in South Dunedin for the last hundred or for the hundred years between 1902 and about 2000. They also protected the seawall at the Esplanade. Prior to that, they had four seawalls get smashed a bit by the bits by the ocean, and it's only when they built the first couple of groins that that stopped. And so they rebuilt them three times through that century, built the beach up by two to three metres, and that pushed the sea. So anybody that is familiar with St. Clair Beach through the 70s, 80s and 90s, of which there are a lot of people still alive, they will know that the beach was 100 metres or more further out that's where the water line was, the high tide line. And that is purely because of the groins. And prior to the groins, the seawall got smashed, the sand dunes got smashed. So the groins made the difference. And the simple thing I want is that one remaining groin to get rebuilt, because it can be done as an existing coastal structure, and that will be rebuilt, and we can see exactly what it does right in front of all of us. And that will inform the whole debate about the about coastal erosion. So that 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 you're thinking there of those famous Sinclair poles, correct? Right, which the, which the, I didn't realise until recently were had had wood along them, right, to stop to, to gather the sand. I thought they were just a jetty of some variety yes. that had fallen down. But that just shows you what I know. The last twenty years, that's what they've been. But prior why did that, the council let it go? Well, people forget. People have got such short term memories. It's quite staggering. They could easily consult the history books, and the, you know the, the history is right there for everyone to see. However, uh, that was not done. It was not done in 1921 when they rebuilt the groins either. So in 1920 they let them go, and in 1950 they let them go. So they were rebuilt. So this is recurring history right through to the recurring history. Yeah. So why do we forget? Because when you ask the council, like I heard the council expert, one of the experts, being asked recently about this, right? I think maybe you asked, um, and and he said, well, listen, it's a it's an equal and op opposite reaction situation. You one side you'll get sand, and the other side will scour it away. No, and that was a triggering moment actually for me because that is simply not true. That's a textbook answer. That is not an answer that involves looking at the actual history of our beach. We're in a very privileged situation here because we get swells from both directions, southwest and northeast, and sand accumulates evenly on both sides of a groin, whereas most parts of the world, particularly in Europe, the uh, swell direction is all one way mm. along a beach, and so sand accumulates on one side of a groin. But that's not the case on our beach here, St Kilda, St Clair. Okay. And so that answer shows that there's been no research on his part into the history of the groins on our beach. Is it risky? Would it be expensive? It what be are the cheap, downsides? It would be unbelievably cheap because that same person is advocating, advocating managed retreat, which is a billion dollars minimum program. And to rebuild that one groin is just $100,000. It's a fraction of what they've spent on consultants for no action and no result. Mandy, Scout, do you care about sand? Does the public care about sand at St Kilda, St Clair? I do care. I think um, going back even further than Jules, uh, we altered the natural landscape. I think that um, where Kettle Park, Marlow Park is, was actually a lagoon, which allowed for a lot of stormwater surge. And um, my feeling is if we excavated that landfill, which is leaching into the water anyway, that perhaps a wetland area could be created where some water could go to. That would be a big job though, wouldn't it? Yes. It would be expensive. But part of Because we issue. saw that, didn't we? The fox, was it fox? Out on the west coast where they just lost mm. one along the river. That's right. Part of the Big issue mess. is every time the seawall at the Esplanade's been replaced, it's been pushed out further and further and further, which is creating a lot of pressure, which is scouring the beach Do, and taking that Would you support sand. groins or not? Um, Jules's groins? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's a good idea, but I think we have to have numerous approaches to make sure something actually works. Mm. And uh, we have a crisis right now with the That's interesting. So you do park. feel that it's important yes. and we need to be onto it. Yes. Scout? Yeah, I like Bandy, I think it's quite a multifaceted issue. We know that a lot of the sand erosion is because of the dams up the Clutha River. The Clutha River used to be the source of our sand and now the sand doesn't get through because there are dams there. But that creates power. So, you know, we need that electricity. Um, I am not opposed to the groins idea. 
I'm also not a engineer in this area, so I'm not going to pretend to know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. But um, I do think that, you know, we've brought up a few issues in the last couple of minutes here, and in terms of Kettle Park itself, you know, you mentioned the Fox, um, Fox River crisis where they've had their landfill basically come out in a storm and now it's washing into the ocean. We We probably need to... We probably need to find a managed way to look after the landfill if we do anything in that area. We'd need to be thinking about it because they had to bring the army in there and spend $10 million or whatever. They did. I mean, this, I'm pretty sure they're still looking for volunteers to go out and help clean up. And that would be a pretty big deal. Jules? So if I may speak back to that because mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's quite significant. All I'm advocating at this point is to rebuild that one remaining groin because it can be done very quickly without a resource consent or anything like that. And then we can see exactly what the groins did in the past and what they do again. And it was put to rest all of the arguments about everything for such a little amount of money. And you know we can measure that accurately and give us something genuine to predict on because I've heard nothing but conjecture about this ever since I put it up. And looking at the Fox River, the apparently uh, I've heard that uh, they were warned, the community was warned that the, uh, the danger to that dump was imminent and they could have put in a stop they could have put in a block on the river to put some heavy rocks to push the river off you know to keep the retain the course of the river so it wouldn't hit the dump and so certain parties certain local parties refused to do it and so for a very little amount of money at that time, they could have prevented that ecological disaster. Are you satisfied that that has happened here? Because the council is saying here that they've done that, right? That they've put in 20 metres of buffer? No, no, no. That's nowhere near Kittle Park. Right. That 20 metres of buffer, if you're talking about the little sandbags in front of Kittle Park, you know, mm. no, that's not going to... Um, that's not going to prevent any decent-sized storm. Are you worried about this? Like, is this is this an imminent it's problem huge. for Dunedin? It yep. is. It's huge. I yep. think the water's already hitting those sandbags. I think a breach could be very possibly imminent. Mm-hmm. If we have a big storm. And so the thing is, you stick in the groin and sand will start accumulating immediately. He's quite confident about that, but he I is. think we have to take more measures. <laughs> all right, but you all agree something should well, be looked at anyway. I mean, would you take? The, the council, That's the question. Uh-huh. The council well, has the ability. What toxic would you take I to think protect that, that Kettle Park? Well, hmm. I think that toxic landfill needs removed before it ends hmm. up in the ocean. Yeah, well, we can't do that instantly. Yeah. That's, That's hundreds, a big job, but you want to look at it. The really, right? the really hmm. wonderful yeah. thing about the city council is that there are quite quite a few staff there and quite a few contractors there, so we can probably do more than one thing at once. Hopefully, yeah. Probably. (laughs) All right. Hey, the time is 5.23, and this is Rattling the Chains on ORFM. With me are three people who would like to be our mayor. Jules Raddick, uh, Mandy Mayhem Bullock, and Scout Barb Evans. Well, um, let's talk about something else. Scout, you have been... (laughs) A bit of an adventure since the last time you stood. You have had a baby. Oh, God, are you about to ask me about the baby again? Well, no, I'm asking <laughs> about the baby, but I tell you, just wondering, like, you're still the youngest, I think, mm-hmm. candidate. By yeah? two years. Yep. yep. And, um, and you know, you've you've been out in the media and out in the public quite a bit. So what are you, what are you trying to, why are you standing? What are you, want to, what are you trying to achieve? It's um, pretty separate from the reasons I've been in the media recently, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um You know, I do a lot of that media around my transition and around being transgender and parenting because there are a lot of kids who don't even know that they're able to be parents one day, that they think that they have to give up on their dream of being parents or having families. So that's completely separate from me running for the mayoralty. I just genuinely think that I would make a really good mayor. I have a lot of the collaborative leadership skills and the facilitatorship skills to be able to coordinate a group of people in a way that maybe they'll get along with each other. Could be quite a good challenge though. Yeah, I mean, my one of my other jobs is facilitating a youth group um, across the hallway. And, you know, if I can manage them, then I can manage this. All right. But do you have specific issues that you want to work on or do you just, um, you just see that there's a role there that you'd like to play? Um, I am campaigning this election on a few issues, mostly because a lot of people asked me to. So I am campaigning on housing, on community resilience and on youth issues. And the thing about all of that is that they overlap. So um, improving the quality of our housing and making sure, you know, advocating on a national stage so that people can stay in their communities for longer means that they build relationships with their communities, which creates in turn a resilient community. But it also directly benefits youth because we are more likely as we grow older to continue to be renting 
for a very, very long time, you know, house prices are getting higher and it is getting harder to get into the yeah. housing market. So what can the council do? And what should it be doing? It, it's limited. Let's be real. It is limited. Um, there, I think that there is room in terms of our new builds to make sure that when resource consents are granted that all houses that are being built, so all dwellings that are being built are to a higher standard than, for example, the current rental laws allow for. Um, we need to be rezoning. We need to look at densifying a lot of the housing in the city and that's not a popular opinion so we do need to make sure that we do it in line with how we maintain our heritage buildings too. What would that look like? More density, more infill? Yeah, um, more apartment buildings, right. more spaces that um, even young families can live in um, to make housing more accessible. The thing is right now, you know, I, I just had to move house, right? I did not expect to have to move house during a mural campaign. I really strongly don't recommend it. It's the worst idea I ever had, to be honest. Mm. But it was impossibly hard to get a house. And the house that I did get, I had to go to a viewing the day after it was listed, apply that day, and I got it three days later. Like, that was... It was really intense. quick and yeah. intense yeah. Yeah. and everything moved really And you quickly. have to be ready to go and exactly. you have to be ready to move and you have to have exactly. the money all set and all everything else, right? Yeah, and so then I had to scramble we're for money because I don't serious, have Yeah, well, we're in a serious housing squeeze right now, right? We are. As a city. Yeah, and not just housing but transport. And if people lived closer to the city, the central city, where they work and study and play, then we wouldn't need so many cars on the roads. You know, there's... A, a lot of these issues are so so multifaceted. Mm. And you want the council to play a greater role or at least more, have more focus on those issues? Yeah, I mean, the, the council has to take a leadership role in this term on housing issues. You know, we do have an impending housing crisis. We've just watched it unfurl in Queenstown and in Auckland and a lot of other cities too. You know, we're quite lucky that this is just starting to unfurl at the start of a term. Mm. Can I ask you about both of those, Manny? Sure. Housing? I think Dunedin has to look at how it's going to grow and, and, and to enable that growth, like Scout says, we need community housing. Um, so that could be apartments or just uh, ways that people live together, uh, like the community housing project on High Street that the council is actually backing. Uh, transport is a huge part of that. Along with the more people, there are more cars. Uh, so we need active transport in the city. I'd like to see the cycleways completed, better public transport put in place. Um, I think that any new builds going forward, uh, changes to the 2GP mean that it'll be easier, say, for you to establish a granny flat or some family-type housing units on your already existing property. That, for me, means if my children... Um, grow up and can't afford a place of their own, potentially I could put a dwelling on my property mm. in order to support them. And I think that's Jules probably... Is, Jules is shaking his head. No, Jules. No, I was just waiting for it to finish. Yeah, yeah no, well, do finish and then I'm going to ask you. You are up to <laughs> right. yeah. uh, I think it's You support that? It would be good? Yes, I think it's important that any new builds also meet a climate safe schedule that we know um, that all of our homes are going to be high and dry and warm, potentially relocatable if we're going to right. build anything and on I see there's some pilots places. going on in, in Waitati, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm. We have a very resilient community and um, mm. I think studio homes and maybe tiny housing will be the way of the future because people won't simply won't be able to afford the three or four bedroom house mm. that Interesting. we've historically had. So some big had. changes coming. Jules, do you want to comment on that? You were shaking your head. Why? Well, because I, I mean, I agree with You're what not, Mandy says right oh, up to good. the point. Oh, good. Yes, you should. Don't That's disagree. Right. I wasn't trying to interrupt you, <laughs> uh, but I was just to let him know that <laughs> I have something to say, which is that the trouble with GTP to uh, two GP is that having built the granny flat for granny, you're not allowed to rent it out to anyone else. So there's a real problem. It has to be rented to a family member, and so that's what I was saying. Family, yes. right? Right. Yeah, but. You want more the, flexibility? Absolutely. I mean, you, having ha built it for Granny or whoever, why not be able to build it for Airbnb or to rent to somebody else or to have a, a, just a tenant come along and use it? And so it's quite it's quite restrictive in that regard. Is there a danger so that a lot of people will build and then get stuck with buildings they can't use? Well, if someone has a Granny flat and then Scout and Baby want to come along and occupy that, you can't unless they're a family member. Right. And so, you know, that's kind of counterintuitive to what we're trying to do is increase, and we've got a housing crisis looming. 
So, you know, I think that's a, a misstep in the 2GP. What else would you do about housing, Jules? Well, the, uh, the city boundaries are quite restricted at the moment, so that needs to be opened up. You know, TGP has got issues there, but that's a long process to get that changed and expanded. So in the meantime, I'm very keen to institute a scheme I called Space Flip. <laughs> I started calling it Space Invaders, but I thought that we'll call it Space oh, yeah. Savers sounds better, oh, yeah. because there's a lot of empty buildings in Dunedin that could be converted to apartments. And at this current point in time, you know, there's not that many apartments happening, apartment conversions. And so that could be encouraged. How do you encourage it? Well, there could be incentives for people to do it mm -hmm. and uh, make it easier to ex uh, get resource consent and building permits for people. So mm -hmm. for a lot of times people just need encouragement. They don't need to have restriction or regulation or necessarily financial incentives or such financial incentives at, that might help don't have to be that large. But if it's positively encouraged and there's a lineup, there's, they know that there's uh, plenty of tenants waiting to take them over, then developers are encouraged to go ahead and do it and they'll invest their own money because they can see a return right. at the end. And of we've it. seen a bit of that success, haven't we, in Vogel Street and we some have. other places. The council's done a very good job right. there. And you know those developers, of course. And you think there's room for more, and and on not just commercial buildings, but residential. Yep, residential. Interesting idea. Yeah. Would you be wanting to stack people up on low-lying areas of reclamation, though? No, there's a danger. Yeah. First floor. <laughs> what if there's an earthquake? Yeah. Good it question. might be a really good opportunity. We've got a lot of um, heritage buildings in Dunedin that have not been kept up to scratch, have not been maintained. They, they look like they could be about to fall to pieces in any minute, especially if the Alpine Fault goes. Um, we It could be a good opportunity to develop those into residential housing that is still um, still maintaining the heritage of those buildings, as we've seen right. on Vogel Street. Gives the so whole they thing did a, push, a really good it? job there right. and set a really good example. Yeah. Mandy, um, you're a celebrant. Yes. Um, but the council has a bit of an image problem, it seems to me. They've got the last residential, um, resident opinion survey, 57% uh, of people satisfied, 47% satisfied with the mayor and councillors. Might have a bit of a job if you're That's right. celebrant in chief. Well, what's wrong with the council and how would you uh, fix it? I think it's a, uh, a bit of a stigma that goes back a long way that we love to hate the council or to blame them or to say we're going to get another rakes height, um, rake, rates hike. I think we need to stop thinking about ourselves as ratepayers and just be the residents of Dunedin. It's important to have an expectation that the council will perform for us, but uh, the public need to understand it's a really difficult job. It's a balancing act, pleasing everybody, and um, it's impossible to do that. But my first and primary focus would be some teamwork exercises uh, uniting the councillors in some mutual camaraderie. I'd be using my martial arts background to um, bring them into line, I think. Mm -hmm. But as a celebrant in a mayoral role, I'm very used to uh, that officiating, you know, leadership, weddings and funerals. I see people at their best and at their worst. And I think those are skills that I can bring to the table in managing the City Council. That makes sense to me, but would you have to do more if you're going to lift the council's satisfaction from 50%? You know, that, that, that means there's a lot of people who feel that the council just isn't doing a good job, right? Bring back public consultation. There needs to be transparency. People need to feel like they have a voice at the table. They are stakeholders in the city's future. So we need to canvas and get out there and say, what do you want? Tell me what you really, really want. No, Scout's nodding. Yeah, um, I think that the council could do a lot better at getting into communities and doing consultation. We've we've been to a few outlying communities so far on the campaign trail and it's been pretty consistent across them all that people don't feel listened to. They feel like people are con the council is constantly doing things to them rather than with them. Um, if, if the council was to improve consultation, then that would go a long way. I think that also this council has, you know, the one that's, the term that's about to end. They inherited a problem. They inherited the problem that previous councils were trying too hard to be liked and so they hadn't done anything to raise the rates to therefore deal with the infrastructure problems. We've had, there's some infrastructure in the city, you know, essential wastewater infrastructure that has been neglected my entire lifetime. I'm 24. Um, I don't want my daughter to be 24 and have these same problems still going. Um, so 
Yeah, the, the current council, they did, and here is a bit of a problem there, and the reason the rates have risen is because the work needs to be done, but that's going to hit people really hard, mm. and that sucks, and I really regret that previous councils didn't do better. Jules? Well, actually, I agree with the two previous speakers. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, what Good. They, both of them say, and uh, you know the, in, the neglect of the infrastructure is a bit like the neglect of the groins, you know, the failure to maintain and the reason why we had floods in South Dunedin. And so that's why I'm starting with values and culture, to try and ingrain that and put that on the wall, that the pride of place is what we're all about, instead of, as Scouts is, trying to be popular. Because there is all constant pressure to press to push rates, rates down, but rates are always going to go up. And... Um, you know, it's just a fact of life. You know, there's inflation out there. Everybody wants to pay, be paid more. Nobody that uh, we would ask in an audience would say, oh, they'd like to be paid less. Yeah. And, and things so just cost more. Things always but, but cost more. But 57% satisfaction, is that good enough? No. Well, I think that is due to a couple of missteps, the recent missteps that the council has made. So firstly, they've failed to stop coastal erosion. So naturally, that's where the groins come in. But the other thing is that park, the cycle lanes... Uh, have, have strongly resented in the community. You know, they've taken a big chunk of the, the traffic flow and a lot of parks out of the, you know, off the one ways. Mm. It's only the one way cycle lanes. The rest of the cycle lanes are okay. But mostly, of course, that was a transport agency. Sure, yeah. NZTA. It. It's such a shame that the council's getting the rap for what the NZTA is doing. So and for the OR. The council does support it, I think, but yeah. They would, uh, NZTA would not have done it without council approval. That's as simple as that. And it's also a misstep. And now they want to uh, make turn George Street into a cycle lane and they have reduced parking, despite the fact that some people in council think there are enough parks. Uh, the majority of the population would say otherwise. So my solution is to put free parking on the periphery and put in inexpensive electric buses so that people can park and ride. They can park on the outside and then take this electric bus which they can use for shopping, for visiting, for tourists, for commuting. We make life really easy and very inexpensive. And so that, that will pull a lot of cars out of the city centre and decongest it right there. Hmm. Maddie, and of course we like to lose the cycle. Do you ride, don't you? Yes, I have been riding the cycleways on a trike to prove that uh, people with mobility issues could potentially use the cycle lanes. They're definitely not perfect because they haven't been completed. So the issue with uh, park and ride, it's great for people who are commuting, but what if you do have access issues, limited mobility, lots of children, you're a senior person, you've got a medical condition, uh, it's not always practical, particularly if the wind is blowing, it's raining. This is Dunedin. Mm. Uh, we need to have options for everybody. So uh, those parks need to be replaced so that people can get close to where they need to be if they've got a mobility problem. And it is a big issue for Dunedin. I think um, with the hospital build coming up, it's something that we urgently need to address We've got a lot of students. Students have more cars. You try and get yourself a park in the university area. Mm. I've got friends who work at the uni or the polytech. They're getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning yeah. to get to town. And you have to circle around like sharks, huh? trying yes. to get one off someone else. That's right. Scout, how do you see the transport and the parking issue? Um, I, I don't use car parks very often because I catch the bus most places. Mm. Um, I... Yeah, it's it's a really tricky situation because at the moment the work that's being done that p appears to be taking away car parks is being done so that people who live within the suburbs and the city itself can use alternative means of transport to get in and out of the city, therefore making space and... Yeah. You know, it all it, theoretically it's, works, we're in this right? Transition period. So I know that people are saying, you know, I mean, I know that the Green candidates are pushing for, for, for this kind of thing because they see that this is the solution longer term. The, the but we haven't got no there, have we? Right. There's a stigma so, around catching a bus. There is a stigma. There really There's also is. a cost. Yeah, and so and that's why uh, sexy buses get used. So you get a, an electric bus loop <laughs> that goes from the university <laughs> to the octagon in a nice square loop. That will take, I think... What's a sexy bus? I don't know. I, I, I don't like bus. the image in my head. <laughs> <laughs> like lips. So How many legs is it called? Some people might take an uh, issue with it, but yeah, that's just oh. to popularise it. Uh, so 
I believe that'll take a whole lot of student cars out because students will realise they don't need to have a car. They can get into town and out easily. And that's similarly with the park and ride. So that will de so ways the to, city. ways to take pressure off so yes. that people who need a park can get one. Is that where, that's where we're going, is it? And here's the key point is that is to do something attractive for people that they want to use rather than try and force them into something that they don't right. want to use. There's only 150 cyclists a day on those you know, one-way cycle lanes. Mm. But it's increasing. And yeah, it is. Yeah, it's gone up 8% from 140. And the question will be how much they use. It's a, a, quite yeah. a bit. It's yeah. They're fairly new. Considering Can, they're not minutes? even finished yet. I like the it's idea negligible. of um, annual concessions for students, for um, beneficiaries, and I think that gold card holders should ride the bus for free all the time. Yeah, I saw you say mm. that, but other candidates have said everyone should be free. So On the weekends? Know. Imagine mm. if everyone could ride a bus on the weekends for oh. free. It's a transition, really, isn't it? We can't make any great, grand change to the city's structure and the city's public transport structure immediately, especially since we're running for the city council, not the regional council. Yeah. But and it, has it to. is ORC who but are in charge But you have to take people with you, don't you? And they don't seem yeah. to have necessarily cracked that yet. Mm. Yeah, anyway. Hey, listen, we've got just a few minutes left. Can I ask you quickly um, a practical one for you, Jules, because you're a business coach. What sort of large business does not let you pay their bills by credit card, nor does it let you email their, their statement to council? How, how, why, why, how come the, I get complaints all the time? The one question people want me to ask is, why does the council not let me pay the bill by credit card and why do they not let me email the, the statement out? You have to get it by post. Any idea? Huh. Would you fix it? <laughs> I want someone well, to fix it. You have to ask their accounts to help, and I suppose they're trying to save that extra percent. There's, uh, you know, there's a couple of percent to, for use of a credit card, and given that people protest strongly to have a 5% increase in rates, uh, the council doesn't want to lose any yeah, money that it do. can. Seems a bit antiquated to I me. I think that's probably a yeah. question for the CEO because right. members yeah. of the city council can't really do anything about operations. You think it's an operational question? Operations. All right, I'll write, yes. I'll write her a letter. Okay. Hey, um, last thing then, voting. Um, it's a, We're an STV, aren't we? Single transferable yeah. vote. Right. So what does that mean? When you when people ask you how should I vote, what do you say to them? Like I say vote for me, number one. Right. And then do you want them to number? Because you have to number, don't you, all the that's way down? Right. It's a Do you want them to number all the way down or do you want yes. them to stop? when they get to a certain point? It's a popularity contest. They have to rate them, the person they like the most, down to the person they like the least. Mm. Is there a strategy? Yeah, I, I'm not 100% on what option is the best, really. Like, I've tried a few different options in terms of voting in STV elections before, and I don't know what really creates the best effect, you know. Um, because you're I allowed also to don't stop, have a aren't you? In this. You're allowed to stop, right? And you, you can you yeah, can vote so for anyone. You don't have to number. But all, if you don't, what, like hundred candidates. Right. But, but if you don't number the bottom ones, then your vote at some at some point stops, right? It yep. won't be transferred. Yeah. So the way that STV works is that if the first candidate that you vote for does not get in, then the second candidate will get your vote. If they don't get in, then the third candidate will. So it's a really good way of being able to vote the underdogs number one if you particularly like them and then the other people that you think might do a good job, you know, two, three, four, five, six, 14. And when I, when I grew up in Australia, we used to vote for the Senate and they used to have to vote mm. one to 47, right? And the great thing was who you put number 47. You always felt good about that, you know? Maybe that's a bit of that going on here too. So yeah, I think I, it takes to the 79th iteration for councillors the last seat to come in. Mm. So some people come in strong straight mm. away at the beginning. You so and your then, advice would be number all of them? Yes. There you go. Me too. All right, you too. Thank you. All I right. just do it, do it as a hobby, really. <laughs> no, you're collecting that too. All right. Hey, um, we're, look, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Um, big thanks to my three guests, uh, Jules Raddick, uh, Scout Barber Evans, and Mandy Mayhem Bullock. All the best to all three of you. Thank you. And um, I will look forward to seeing what happens on October 12th. Me too. Um, voting starts this week, I think. Uh, voting papers are coming out on Friday, and you should get them in your post by uh, next Wednesday at the latest. So... You have a good fortnight to vote, and there's really no excuse not to number all number all your people. Um, there's also a mobile booth, I'm told, that's out there if you want to uh, vote in person at the DCC. Um, right, if you liked this program, then or any of the past six programs, then you can dial them up again on our website. It's oar.org.nz, and you just go to Rattling the Chains, and they've also all been videoed. So uh, you can get that on the site or on Facebook or on YouTube. So hopefully, having watched all of them, you'll know who you want to vote for. Thanks so much to my brilliant production team. Couldn't have asked for more from Leslie, Jeff, Domi, and Jeff. And thanks most importantly to you for being part of this series. 
uh, which has gone for six weeks and uh, we'll come back in three years time if we need it. And uh, thank you for listening. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, katoa. Thanks, Aaron.